Well, I want to move a little bit further along. We're talking about who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And I've been talking for some weeks off and on about the doctrine of Jesus Christ, his identity, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Last time we talked about the significance of his death. I want to move forward tonight and talk about his burial and his resurrection. So we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm using the New King James as the primary text here tonight. Uh, in We've looked at 1 Corinthians 15 in times past. I want to look at it a little bit here today in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand. So Paul says, uh, here is the gospel that I proclaim to you. In verse 3, he says that Christ died for our sins. And that's the first point of the gospel, which we've covered in the last couple lessons that we taught. But notice verse 4 and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the gospel message in a nutshell is that Jesus Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose again. And I want to focus on the fact that he was buried and that he rose again. Sometimes we just skip over the burial. We hear some preaching and teaching about his death, we hear preaching and teaching about his resurrection, but what about his burial? It's mentioned as part of the gospel message. And so that's my point today, that we don't need to overlook his burial, but it serves several helpful purposes. First of all, it demonstrates that his death was a reality. Now, in ancient times and even today, Critics try to get around the scriptures and say, well, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. Maybe he was overcome by exhaustion and pain and he slumped down into unconsciousness. They took him off the cross and sometime later he revived. Well, you might buy that theory until you study how he was buried. When you find out that he was wrapped and bound in burial clothes, he was put in a tomb the stone was rolled in front of the tomb. It was sealed. Roman guards were put in its place. It is all showing that the, the circumstances of his burial shows he really died. As far as humanly speaking, that was the end. It was settled. It was done. It was definite. But, of course, we know that on the third day, when the women came to uh, anoint his body, they found the stone was rolled away. The guards had no explanation for what happened, but instead of guards standing over a sealed tomb, the stone was rolled away. When they looked inside, they found the tomb was empty, and then angels appeared to them to say, He's not dead, He is risen. So the circumstances of His burial also prove that His resurrection was a reality. You can try to deny his resurrection and say, well, it's impossible from a medical standpoint, from a physical standpoint and all that. But the unanswered question remains, how do you explain the empty tomb? How do you explain that the stone was rolled away? How do you explain that the Roman guards couldn't stop whatever hap happened from happening? And so the burial is a, uh, a crucial link to emphasizing the reality of his death and also the reality of his resurrection. And then further, the New Testament applies his burial to our experience of salvation. In Romans chapter 3, excuse me, Romans chapter 6, it tells us that we identify with the death of Jesus Christ. And more specifically, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so what we find when we come to God and we decide to live for the Lord, we repent of our sins, that's death. We die out to our old way of life, to our selfish desires. But then, just as Christ died on the cross, but then was buried, completely submerged uh, in this tomb, so also we are to be buried with Jesus Christ in water baptism. 
And that's why we emphasize the name of Jesus. When you hear me baptize someone, I will say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because we are identifying personally with our Savior. He's the one who died for us. We understand that God is our Heavenly Father. We understand that the Holy Spirit is God coming to dwell in our lives. But we understand that God's Spirit couldn't, couldn't die. God's Spirit couldn't shed blood. God's Spirit couldn't uh, be placed in a tomb. But Jesus, the man Christ Jesus died for us. His blood was shed. He was placed in a tomb. And so we identify specifically with Jesus Christ as our personal Savior when we're baptized in Jesus' name. And of course, baptism itself is incomplete without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where that gives us new life. And that corresponds to the resurrection. So we understand that Christ's burial helps us, teaches us, how we should respond to the gospel, not only through repentance, but through water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. It is a burial with Christ. And it teaches a lot of interesting points there that would refute some of the practices throughout the ages. For instance, you don't bury someone until they're dead. So you don't baptize someone until they've truly repented of their sins. You don't bury someone by pouring a handful of dirt on them. Nor do you baptize someone by pouring a little bit of water on them, but you put them down under the water. So you can see that Christ's burial helps us understand his purpose and his plan in New Testament salvation. Now, let's go a little bit further. What happened when Jesus was buried? Now, it's easy to understand that his body was placed in the tomb. His body did not decay. God miraculously stopped uh, any process of decay so that he could be raised up on the third day. But Jesus was more than a body. He was a true human being in every way like us except for sin. But he had uh, human will, a human mind, human soul, human spirit. By that, I, I mean he had the full human personality, human emotions, now, we wouldn't say that he had a spirit separate from God, but we would say that both humanity and deity were joined in his spirit. And as I said, he was a human like us in every way. So when we say what happened with Jesus when he died and was buried, well, maybe we should ask what happens to us. Or more specifically, when someone died at that time in history, what happened to them? Well, according to the Old Testament, when people die, they went to the place called Sheol, or that's the uh, Hebrew term, S-H-E-O-L, or the Greek term is Hades, H-A-D-E-S. In the King James, that's often translated by the word hell, the English word hell, but that's a little bit confusing because the English word hell is used in the Bible of this place called Hades, the abode of the dead, it's also used of the lake of fire, which is really a very different concept. And so what you'll find in modern translations to make that distinction, they will actually translate uh, the, that word and, or usually just bring it in the New Testament as Hades, the place of the dead. Now, I will give you a little bit of scripture, but perhaps you can recall the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, some say, well, it's a parable. Even if you regard it as a parable, a parable is a true-to-life story. A parable is not a fantasy, but it's uh, a, 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 an example drawn from real life. Uh, so I think that story in Luke 16 is instructive. You recall that the rich man died. He went to a place of torment. The poor man, Lazarus, died. He went to a place of rest called Abraham's bosom. But they could, there was a gulf between them or some separation. But the rich man could call out. And he called out to Abraham and said, uh, you know, deliver me. And then if that can't be done, well, at least you can send Lazarus to uh, bring me some water. Uh, or at least send someone back uh, from the dead to my brothers to witness to them so they don't come to this place. Well, you get a picture of a place of waiting. It doesn't indicate they were in the direct presence of the Lord. 
it doesn't indicate that they're in a permanent place called heaven. It indicates that both those who were saved and lost were in a similar place, separated. On one side was torment, on the other side was rest, but they were waiting the judgment. Uh, and they were in a spiritual form, not with resurrected bodies yet. They were waiting the resurrection. So that seems to be what happened in Old Testament times. And so whether someone served God or not, the Bible speaks of their body going to the grave, their soul going to Hades or Sheol or the place of the dead. In that sense, everybody went to the place of the dead to await the resurrection. Well, if you think of that, what would have happened to Jesus? His body died and was placed in the tomb. But what about the inward spiritual nature? A human being is more than a body. Jesus was more than a body. He was a real human. Well, I believe that that his spirit was one spirit, so he was both he was God manifested in the flesh even during the time of his physical death. So I believe that Jesus in in the spirit visited the place of the dead. As a real human, he would have to undergo death. He couldn't escape. And when we say death, we don't simply mean uh, your body going unconscious. We mean the soul separating from the body and the soul going to this place of waiting. So we have to think of the human soul of Jesus, which again, I would not say was separated from the Spirit of God, but joined to the Spirit of God. Nevertheless, just looking at him as a human, look at his human aspect, we would have to consider if he was really like us, he would have to visit the place of the dead in the spirit realm. As a human soul, he would have to visit the place where human souls go when they die. Now, if that sounds far-fetched, let me give you some scripture. There is a prophecy from the book of Psalms from David that uh, the Apostle Peter used on the day of Pentecost. And so we'll read it, Acts chapter 2. And uh, Peter is quoting from David, referring to David. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, that's David, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of of the Christ. And then this is a quote from the book of Psalms. I'm actually reading from Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 30 and verse 32. But in turn, in this passage, uh, the apostle Peter is quoting from David. And here's the quote that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. And that's exactly what I've showed to you. The Christ, he would die like humans. And his soul would go to Hades like humans. But the difference is his soul would not stay there. His body would go to the grave like all other humans. But the difference is his body would not see corruption. And then the quote goes on, This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. So it appears that when Jesus died and his body was placed in the tomb, he in the spirit realm went to the place of the dead and visited it. Now, what in the world did he do there? Let's read some passages to see if we can get some ideas. And some of this may be uh, a little speculative, you might say, or, or hidden. But I think there's enough evidence to put this together. Romans chapter 10, verse 7. Who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. So Romans is speaking of Christ going into the abyss, this place uh where the dead go. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, I am he who lives and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. So Jesus, the victorious Christ, the resurrected, ascended Christ, who appeared to John, the book of Revelation, he says, I have the keys of this place called Hades, and I have the keys of this place called death. Well, what that indicates, I have won the victory over Hades and death. So over the spiritual realm where the dead go, and over the physical realm where the dead go. So every other human being, when they die, their soul goes to Hades, their body goes into the grave, but he says, I have come back. 
I have conquered both Hades and death. So he indicated I went down there, but I didn't stay down there. I came back out. So the reason why he went down there is to identify with us. The reason why he came out is to win victory, to show that this is what's going to happen to us. If you and I die tonight, our body will go into the grave. And our soul will go into Hades, or at least it will go into a place of waiting. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the promise we have is that we're not going to stay there because Jesus has already been there and done that. He came out on the other side. And so he has the keys. The devil doesn't have the keys. Jesus has the keys. And so we might be temporarily uh, locked up, so to speak, waiting the resurrection. But don't you worry. The Lord has the key. On that great resurrection morning, we'll rise to meet him in the air. Praise God. Because he was buried and he came out of there. In 1 Corinthians 15, which we've referred to several times, the sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. When the law tells us not to sin, we sin, the penalty is death. That's the sting. But if you read the rest of the passage, which I'm not going to go through that, Jesus has taken that away. So, uh, you know, oh Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Because Jesus has won the victory. I probably should have gone ahead and quoted the rest of that so that you could see that Jesus won the victory over death and uh, over the grave. Hebrews 2.14, which we've also referred to, I'll just mention, that he destroyed him who had the power of death, that is the devil. So whatever power the devil had, he doesn't have it anymore After Jesus died and was buried and rose again, Jesus has the power over death itself. The devil doesn't have that. Now, here's where I said maybe it might be a little speculative, but if you you carry this through, I think it makes sense. In Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, Therefore he says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So Christ first descended into the lower parts of the earth. I think that's talking about his death and his burial. But then he ascended, he rose again, he ascended to heaven. But notice that curious little thing. Statement, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, in Ephesians 4, it goes on to say God has given gifts to the church, the five-fold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So we know when he says he gave gifts to men, he's talking about the church. Uh, By his resurrection and ascension, he is able to give gifts to his church. But what does it mean that he led captivity captive? There's an indication there are people who are captive... And he led them away captive. Now, you can see a symbolism here. I mentioned to you earlier in a previous lesson that the resurrection of Christ is spoken of as a a triumph. That the Roman uh, generals, when they would win a victory over the enemy, then they would have a procession in the streets of Rome and they would lead all the captives through the streets. And uh, at the climactic moment, they would cause the the enemy general to fall on the ground and they would put their feet on, on his head and they would demonstrate in the eyes of all the multitude of Romans, we have conquered the enemy and they are our captives. So there may be something like this where the enemy general has a group of captives but jesus comes and defeats the enemy general and he takes the captives for himself and leads them away to deliverance so he led captivity captive so what that could mean is when he went into the place of the dead Now, if we look at the story of the rich man and Lazarus, even though Lazarus was a righteous man, he was in this place of waiting, separated from the rich man. It doesn't seem that he was in the direct presence of God, but he was in the presence of Abraham. It was obviously a place of blessing and rest, but it seems to be a place of waiting. 
Now that would make sense because even though the Old Testament saints were saved by grace through faith, the price had not been paid for their sins. Calvary had not happened yet. And God is always faithful to his word. So how could they go into heaven, the immediate presence of the Lord, when the price had not been paid? So it seems that they were in this place of waiting. But when Jesus went down, what I'm picturing here is that he took all the righteous souls of all the ages who are waiting for deliverance. And he said, in essence, the price has now been paid. I paid the price for the sins of the whole world. You died in faith waiting for that price to be paid. You died in faith believing that God had a plan of salvation for you. I've come to announce it is finished. It is done. You no longer have to wait here. I'm leading you out of this place of waiting into the presence of the Lord. So even though they're still waiting the resurrection, they're now in God's presence. Because we find, I'll show you in a minute, that when we die today, Scripture doesn't indicate that we go to this place of waiting. It indicates that in our spirits, we are in the presence of the Lord, even though we're still waiting to be restored with our glorified body. So let me go on and and show you that in the next uh, statement, because uh, after Calvary, after the resurrection of Jesus, now I've given you the before, Luke 16, uh, here's what I've been talking about. Uh, the, 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 the beggar died, and he went to Abraham's bosom. The rich man died, and he went to Hades, but he saw Abraham and Lazarus in his bosom. So he, he saw them in another compartment of Hades or another area of Hades, Uh, But they were still waiting. But now the Apostle Paul says in our day, after the resurrection of Christ, for I am, uh, Philippians 1.23, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And then he goes on to say, or to stay with you, which is needful for you. So Paul can speak of, when I die, I will be with Christ. So he doesn't say, when I die, I will be in Abraham's bosom or I will be in Hades, I will be in uh, a peaceful part of Hades where I'm at rest. He says, when I die, I'll be with Christ, wherever the Lord is. And so we don't picture the Lord waiting in Hades. We picture the Lord as having come out of Hades, and he has ascended to heaven. He rules and reigns as God manifests in the flesh. And so Paul says, my expectation is I will be with Christ when, when I die. And then you see another Example, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So for the Christian, when we die, we're absent from our body until the resurrection. But we're not just in a place of waiting. We are in the presence of the Lord. So while we do wait the final resurrection, we are waiting in the presence of the Lord. Of course, you read the book of Revelation, you'll find even the righteous souls, the, the people that were martyred, they, they were crying out for God to give justice, but they were pictured as being in the presence of the Lord. So if what I'm saying all fits together, I would say that what Jesus did, and uh, you also have the passage in First Peter, which I didn't put down here, which talks about uh, Christ preaching to the souls in prison. Uh, And that might sound strange. Was he offering the people who had already died a second chance to be saved? But the word preached there is proclamation. Uh, In other words, what I envision is that when Christ died, while his body lay in the tomb, he went down in the spirit realm and he announced, I have won the victory. All of you who've been waiting for deliverance, the time has come. I'm leading you out of Hades. I'm leading you into the presence of the Lord. And there you will ever be in the presence of the Lord because I now have the keys of Hades and of death. He led captivity captive. He delivered the righteous souls who had been waiting. And so now our destiny, if we die as children of God, we will go into the presence of the Lord. Praise God. So that happened by the burial of Jesus Christ. But of course, the burial is not all there is to it. He also arose from the dead. He died, he was buried, and he rose again. And just like I would say about his death, 
Christianity uniquely depends upon the resurrection of its founder. All other religions, they presume their founders are dead. Uh, you can believe in Islam knowing that Muhammad is dead. You can believe and be a good Buddhist knowing that Buddha is dead. But you can't be a good Christian believing that Jesus is simply dead. Uh, if Jesus is still dead, we don't have Christianity. We uh, depend upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ for our message. It's part of the gospel message. I've already quoted when we started that the gospel includes that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And this message is necessary for our salvation. If Christ merely died, but he didn't arise again, then we have no victory. His death alone would have been a defeat. It was his victory, his, his resurrection that turned defeat into victory. Praise God. Even though he paid the price by his death, what good would that be if he's still dead? So we often talk about the blood of Jesus, the death of Jesus. That's all great. But understand we say we're saved by the blood or we're saved by his death, or we're saved by the atonement, really we ought to be thinking of death, burial, and resurrection. So if I say we're saved by the blood of Jesus, that's a shorthand way of saying I'm saved by his death, burial, and resurrection. We focus on the blood because that's the, the agent of atonement, you might say. But we understand the blood is not effective without the resurrection. You can't separate it. You have to have it as a whole. Same way with our salvation. You know, we might look at a scripture that says if you repent and you'll be forgiven or receive repentance unto life. Is it just repentance only? Well, no. It talks about being baptized for the remission of sins. Well, is it baptism only? Well, no. It talks about receiving the Holy Spirit, new life. You really can't separate them apart. You can identify the steps, but you need the complete work. And so somebody will say, well, when's the blood apply? Well, I think when you repent. Well, I think it's when you're baptized. Well, I think it's when you receive the Holy Ghost. Well, it's the whole process. The blood is applied at baptism for the remission of sins, but you can't separate the blood just to one thing. It's the whole process. And so when we say we're saved by his death, that's right. But we're in, in, internally, we need to be thinking death, burial, and resurrection. It's not finished without the resurrection. We say, I plead the blood. That's right. But we need to keep in our minds, we're basing it on his death, burial, and resurrection. Because if he's, if he's still dead, what power does his blood have? It has no more power than Buddha or Muhammad or any other dead man's blood. But because he rose again, his blood has power. Praise God. Now, let me give you scripture for this, just so you'll know I'm not uh, just running off with it. But there are many passages of scriptures that show, show us. Uh, Romans 4.25, he was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. So our justification depends not only on his death, but also on his resurrection. Romans 10.9, here's the basis of all salvation. You confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. If you don't believe that God is raising from the dead, you're not going to be baptized. You're not going to receive the Holy Ghost. It's not going to work unless you believe not only his death, but also his resurrection. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 14, a very plain statement. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. Your faith is vain. You are still in your sins. You see, the, uh, believing in Christ is not just a religion of man's search for God or man making himself better. It's God transforming humans. And so, therefore, it's not by our works. And that is a strong statement. If Christ is not risen, your, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. How can it be such a strong statement? Because our salvation is not based on our works. Salvation is based on the work of Jesus Christ. If he didn't rise again, he didn't do any work, we're still in our sins. That's a radical statement. Every other religion says we're saved by what we do. But Christianity says we're saved by what Jesus Christ has done for us. Amen. 
So it is a radical statement. We are totally dependent on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. If he didn't rise from the dead, we have no hope. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Now, when he rose from the dead, it was a real, a physical resurrection. Now, he had a glorified body, a transformed body. But it was not just uh, a spirit. It was a tangible, physical body. Let me just give you some scripture here. Luke 24, 39, the resurrected Christ said to the disciples, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So he was tangible. You could touch him. You could hold him. Uh, Luke 24, 43, he ate bread in the presence of these people. He ate, he sat down and ate with him. So he could actually process things physically. He was not bound by physical limitations, but he had physical existence. Luke 24, 46 he said, thus it is written, thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So this is a physical resurrection. To rise from the dead indicates not just transform, not just my spirit set free to float around, but actually rising back up from the dead. Now, when he rose from the dead, it was a transformed body, a glorified, immortal body. But nevertheless, it was recognizably his body. There was a continuity between the pre-resurrection body and the resurrection body. There was continuity and transformation. All right. Uh, 1542, 1 Corinthians 15.42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. So you see it's using the example of a, a planting. So a seed is sown, okay? When the seed sprouts and comes up, it's a new plant. It doesn't look very much like the seed, but actually it is that same seed, isn't it? That plant was hidden in that seed and grows up. It's the same genetic structure. It's the same identical thing taking on new life and transformation. So that's like the resurrection of the body. The body is sown in death, buried, but it's the same body. It is, it is being transformed. The difference is it was corruptible, but when it's raised, it's raised to be incorruptible. So I think Christ's body during his earthly life, if you had cut him, he would bleed. I mean, that's obviously the case. When he was beaten on the back, he bled. Uh, but when he died, it would have decayed had not God stopped it. But God stopped it and transformed him. So the resurrection body, I think if you cut it, it probably wouldn't believe because it's incorruptible. So it's the same body but transformed from corruption to incorruption. It can't, it can't die anymore. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So the man of dust is our mortal body. The heavenly man is our transformed body. Philippians 3, 20 through 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform, here's the word, our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Now, this is teaching us about Christ's body, but also our future resurrection body. And notice it didn't say you'll, you'll get rid of one body and get another body. It says it'll be transformed. So uh, it will be conformed to his glorious body. Now, I don't know how all that will work. That's something known only to the Lord. So I don't know if your prime age was age 20 or age 30, if God will resurrect you in the prime of life. Who knows how it'll be. But it'll be a glorious body. It will be a glorified body. All right. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a real uh, event, and it shows us how we are going to be resurrected. Well, I've got a little bit more, but I'm going to stop at this point. We'll probably have time for another lesson or so. Uh, but the point being, he died for our sins. He was buried in the tomb. He rose again the third day. And by his resurrection, he won victory. 
He won victory over death, over physical limitations, corruption. Uh, He won victory over Hades, hell, or the place of the dead, so that now when we die, we don't have to go to a place of waiting indefinitely, but we go into the presence of the Lord. And we have the assurance of a future resurrection where our body will be raised from the grave and be reunited with our spirit, our soul, and we will live forever with Christ in a glorified body in the place called heaven, which to me, heaven is where the presence of the Lord is. And that gets into another subject. But the new Jerusalem, which I believe will be a city on or over the new earth, that will essentially be heaven because it'll be where Jesus is, and wherever he is, that's what where heaven is. Heaven is not primarily outer space, although that can be one definition. Heaven is not primarily, uh, you know, some mystical existence, but heaven is wherever God is, wherever he dwells, and wherever the glorified body of Jesus Christ. And I believe that Christ has a glorified body. It's in some location. Now, it may not be in our universe. It may be in... Uh, you know, in a, 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 if you want to call it a spiritual universe, but it's a real place and he's really coming back to this world and we will rise to meet him and we will dwell with him forever. Praise God. That's our hope. And it's based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's stand together and I want us to worship him. Let's give him thanks for what he's done for us and the hope that we have, the assurance that we have. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the assurance that we have in you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the promise that we have, the hope that we have, the resurrection life that we can participate beginning right now. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. If anyone would like to come and pray, if you need a touch from God, we'll be glad to pray with you and apply the benefits of his resurrection to us right now. If you need healing for your body, if you need to receive the Holy Ghost, this is a good opportunity. Amen. Amen. Let's just close in in giving God thanks one more time. And if you want to come to the front to pray, then please do so. Thank you, Lord, once again. For the gospel message, the message that brings life to us, the message that gives us hope and assurance. Praise you, Lord, that you have won the victory over hell and death, that you've won the victory over Hades, and you have given us that victory tonight. Praise your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be dismissed.